In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Today, we are celebrating the 23rd Sunday after Pentecost. And as you know, uh, there are only 24 Sundays after Pentecost, plus any extras we have to catch up from uh, if Easter was a little bit early. So we'll have one more to catch up with next week. But that means we're coming to the end of our life, according to the liturgical calendar, which goes through one year as if it was our entire life. And as we come close to the end of our life, the church is asking us to take a look at what is really important. And here we are told in the first reading that our citizenship is not here on this earth. We're just passing through. We're on a journey. Where are we supposed to be ending up? In heaven. And if we don't get there, it's our own darn fault. And that's what these readings are all about. But here's the amazing thing. Even when it's our own fault, we can still ask God to be merciful. And that's what we do in the Collect of the Mass today. It says here in the, I've, I've got both the missiles that we use here in the, that we have in the pews, the hardcover and the little black one. And the little black one, is the translation is a little bit different than the, than the hardcover one. And so I'm going to let you hear both of them as I tell you a little bit about the difference. O Lord, we beseech thee, absolve thy people from their offenses that through thy bountiful goodness we may be freed from the bonds of those sins by which, which by frailty we have committed. The second one says, Remit we beseech thee, O Lord, the sins of thy people, that by thy kindness we may be delivered from the trammels of our sins in which through our frailty we have become entangled. Now both of those are very good translations of this prayer but they each use slightly different words as the translator is trying to figure out what message to get across. In the first one that we have here, um, where it says, O Lord, we beseech thee, absolve thy people from their offenses. I do like that uh, word, absolve, because everybody here should be used to hearing that word, ego te absolvo, I absolve you of your sins. That's what I tell you in the confessional. As I am sitting in the person of Jesus Christ, it is Christ himself that is giving you this absolution. Through me, his humble priest, I am giving you God's grace of wiping out your sins. And here we are asking him to wipe away our sins, to absolve the sins. In the hardcover, it says remit the sins. It still makes sense to remit the sins, but we don't use that word remit as often as absolve. As it, but it goes on in the hardcover where it says remit, it specifically calls these things sins. And in the word, in the softcover one where it says absolve, it doesn't say sins, it says offenses. And I like the word sins a little bit more than offenses because we can offend people without sinning. In fact, I offend people all the time just by wearing a collar. And people who don't want anything to do with God are very offended that I would be in public wearing a collar. This happens a lot, unfortunately, with priests who don't want to be seen as priests when we're out together. What are you doing wearing that collar? Can't you just go casual for a while? But this is an offense without being a sin. And here's what, what I believe, that it would be really nice to hear absolve and sins in the same translation. But we don't have it in the same translation. It goes on to say that uh, God's, we're asking for God to forgive these things or absolve these things or remit these things, whether they're offenses or sins, through his bountiful goodness in one translation and simply through his kindness in another. And when we're coming up to Thanksgiving, bountiful goodness is for us a little bit more appropriate because we always are going to have posters and advertisements and everything about the bounty that we have. And we're, we have the cornucopia, the, the horn of plenty that's overflowing with food and all of this a bountiful goodness. And we know that in the secular world. We should know this in the religious life as well. I think bountiful goodness is more in line with what God is doing instead of just being kind. Because being kind has kind of a bad connotation right now. Oh, the, the, the nice people out there, the ones who are kind. It doesn't mean they're moral at all. It just means that they sweep up their sidewalk instead of letting trash grow and, and things like that. I, I like the bountiful kindness. And then that we may be freed from the bonds of those sins by frailty we have committed. You see, this I really like this one. Instead of saying that we have been 
placed in a position by others where we have sinned, instead of saying it's other people's faults, which our world is telling us nothing that you do is your own fault, it's usually mom and dad's fault. They didn't raise you right. They probably raised you too Catholic, and that's why you're so bad right now. They forced you to do all these moral things, and that's why you're so moral now, and they think that's a bad thing. It's always somebody else's fault, but here we're saying, no, this is our fault. No matter what we're calling this, whether it's a sin or offense, we're, we're acknowledging finally, and this is where it takes it, at the end of life, where we finally come around to say, it doesn't matter. I could have had the worst upbringing in the entire world. I might have had a mother and a father who were absolutely horrible, the closest things to demons upon this earth, and it's still my fault now. I had to finally grow up and recognize that I have to take responsibility for my own actions, for my own thoughts, for my own deeds, for my own words. It's not that I got a bad education. I can't blame the teachers for not teaching me properly. It's not that the priest was a, a, a heretic and was giving me bad information. Whatever the problems are, by the time I'm near the end of my life, I have to finally get to the point that I'm spiritually mature and say, oh God, have mercy on me, a sinner. It's my sins, not somebody else's. Not have mercy on me because of their sins. No, it's my fault. I like both of these, how they put it in, it's ours. But I really like the, the hardcover one where it gives the example of we become entangled in the sins. And this is what we really do have a problem with. We get so entangled in our own sins, at, that are our own fault, that we find, a hard, we find it hard to get out. If any of you have ever been fishermen and you've ever thrown a cast net, you'll understand what it is when you get a fish that has their gills caught in the net. The fish was just big enough not to fit through the hole, but too small to come out without you having to really struggle to get him out. He cannot, cannot get out on his own. And it takes a lot of work to get, a, get that fish at just that size out of that net. We become entangled in our own sins like this, and we're asking the Lord to be the fisherman here, to grab a hold of us and to yank it, to even cut the net if that's what it takes in order to release us from the, this entanglement to our sins because too often we get so caught up in our sins, we've done it so often that we just don't know how to get out ourselves. We can struggle all we want and flop around all we want and most of the time we're just beating our heads against the rock as the fish does as you've got them up on the bank. And we're going to die unless we're released. And this is at the end of life, gasping our last gasp. We're asking our Lord, don't let me die and stay here. Let me die in your grace and let me go to where my aim is anyway, to get to heaven. Now, it doesn't really work that way when you're a fisherman because a fisherman's going to take you and either use you for bait or eat you but our Lord is going to take you and love you. And we're asking at the end of our life, the liturgical end of our life, perhaps the physical end of our life, we're asking our Lord to be merciful, even when we're acknowledging we don't deserve it. We're not blaming him for anything or anyone else. We're not saying it was too hard and you didn't give me the grace. We're saying it is my sin that I'm asking absolution from. And I'm sorry. When we get to that point where we take full responsibility for our sins, then we're ready for heaven. We're ready to accept the graces that he wants to give us at the end of life. Whether it is the priest coming in while you're on your deathbed, and he hears your confession for the last time, and he gives you absolution, and then gives you the anointing of the sick or extreme unction, asking that the Lord would be merciful and forgive you any of the sins you've committed through any of your senses, and then gives you the apostolic blessing, perhaps even along with the Atticum, Holy Communion, your food for the journey. Maybe that's the way you're going to die. And what a beautiful acceptance of all the graces that the priest will give. But perhaps you won't, because most people do not die like that. Perhaps you will die by yourself. With all this going on right now, it could be that you're in a hospital and nobody is allowed in, not even the priest. It could be that you're by yourself and 
Satan will be trying to convince you that it was all for naught and that God, too, has abandoned you. But if you've gotten to the point that you're actually praying this prayer, where you truly are trusting in God and acknowledging it's your own fault for everything, oh, this is the time when you can be at peace even when you are lonely, even when you seem to be abandoned, even when you want to curse the government for what they're doing to you. You can indeed be at peace, at rest. You can be convinced that God is with you. Along with this prayer, we have the intro to the Mass. And it is a little section from Jeremiah's book. This great prophet had been warning the people about their sins, and they were not ready to accept that they were even sinning, let alone that they needed to change their ways. He had been warning them that God was not pleased with what they were doing. He was giving them a, a great message of hope, for he said, if you turn back from your sins, God will repent right now, and he will embrace you, and he will make you a great nation once again. But if you stay on your path, he will be forced to bring his justice upon you. And the people did not pay any attention. Oh, I'm sorry, that's a bad way to put it. They did pay attention, and they wanted to kill him. They hated him for telling them the truth. They wanted to do everything on their own. They were on a pilgrimage to heaven, but they got comfortable on earth. And instead of wanting to be with God, they wanted to be away from God because they thought they were happier as they were away from him, as they threw off the shackles of his requirements. In order for us to love, he gave us requirements, and they thought they could love without our Lord showing them what true love was. The little bit that we have here today is Jeremiah, as he's writing to them, after what he had predicted had come true. He had told them that God would be merciful if they repent, but justice would come if they did not. They did not repent, and they were conquered. I want you to keep this in mind because history does repeat itself, and it is our sins that have made us comfortable with our citizenship here as it was with the ancient Israelites. It is our sins, the fact that we like the things of this world more than the things of heaven that have caused all of the havoc that we're going through right now. It is our sins. And we have been told by many people in the church, or at least a few, that we need to turn away and we need to become more godly more than worldly, and we have failed to do so. Jeremiah is leaving them with this message. You are now in exile. You cannot worship God as you wished, as you should have wished, because you are no longer in Jerusalem. You cannot offer up the sacrifices that God was asking of you, and you were giving but half-heartedly. You were giving, but along with the sacrifices to the false gods. But here's the message that I'm leaving you. God will repent of what he has done in his anger, using human way of looking at it. He will allow, allow you to learn your lesson, but he will bring you back. The unfortunate part of this message is he said it would take 70 years before he would bring the people back. And, of course, you know that is what happened. Seventy years in order to come back to our Lord meant that all of the people who could listen and understand what he was saying would be dead. He was preparing them for the next generation. And he was teaching them that your sins caused your destruction and you will die in exile because of it. But God will be merciful to your children and to your children's children if you teach them the truth, if you show them that what you did caused your destruction and encourage them not to follow in your footsteps, if you don't just give up and say all is lost, but rather you say, I'm going to teach you the faith that I refuse to live. I'm going to teach you the truth that I rejected. I'm going to teach you about God and how to love him even though I love the things of this world. Today I want to leave you with that same message. 
For so many people are saying, all is lost. The world is going to hell in a handbasket, and there is nothing we can do. And they are, perhaps, quite right. It is our sins that have put us in the mess that we're in right now. We have wanted the things of this world more than we have wanted the things of the next. And we have done a horrible job in allowing immoral people to rule over us as long as they've made this world comfortable, regardless of morality, which is looking towards the next world. And we are in quite a pickle right now. And we may even, not yet known for certain, we may even face exile. We may not be in a comfortable place in this world any longer. But what must we do? We must never despair and never give up, but repent and ask God, be merciful to me and absolve me from my sins, those things that I have ensnared myself in, those things that I have willingly committed against your love. Be merciful and absolve me. In your boundless in bounty and kindness, Lord, give me what I don't deserve, but protect me now and give me the grace to teach the next generation. Let me teach my grandchildren what I did not teach my children. Let me pass on to the next generations the fullness of the Catholic faith so that they can come back stronger than I ever was. Give me the grace of not falling into despair but turning to you now at the end of my life and helping those who will live beyond my life to know you, to love you, and to serve you in this world so that they can be with you forever, happy in the next. These prayers are powerful prayers, and they will produce saints. Those who went into exile did not listen to Jeremiah beforehand, but if they listened to this little bit, then they would have made it to heaven anyway. For God will forgive and absolve, and he will be merciful even at the end of life when the people finally turn to him. May that happen to us today. May we become convinced that our citizenship is in heaven. May we never be content with the things of this world, but only want the things of the next. May we repent of our sins from the bottom of our heart, and may we teach the next generations how to be better than we ever were, to teach them that God's love is better than love of the world. If we do so, we will be raising saints. God will be merciful, and we will all make it to heaven together. May God hear and answer this prayer as we offer up the holy sacrifice of the Mass, the sacrifice offered for our salvation. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.